in any case, uh, I know it's late in the week, so I'll try to just tell you some stories. Uh, and so remember uh, from Wednesday, Uh, remember from Wednesday, uh, Professor Sawada was talking about the early work of Edel Wasserman, who made uh, by a stochastic process a tiny bit of a catenane by cyclization. And in that same paper, uh, Wasserman thought, well, maybe a single molecule might be long enough to sometimes not itself stochastically before it cyclizes. And in this way, I might get a trefoil knot. But he didn't get even, he didn't even get almost 0% yield. He just didn't make a trip. Well, not at this time, but he had the thought. Uh, but some years later, he came back to this hypothetical knot, had he made it? And he asked himself the question, what would be its response or its differential response or optical activity to left and right circularly polarized light? Uh, uh, he didn't make the knot, of course. Uh, but uh, he thought he could calculate this response. And at that time, the only way he could approach it was by using classical physics, by using the coupling of anisotropic polarizable groups spaced along the curve of the trefoil knot. And he calculated by classical physics a very small effect, a small effect that we were able to confirm with more sophisticated calculations that are based on wave functions that we can do today. Uh, but in any case, an effect so small, it's not even worth talking about or worrying about. But in any case, I think by now, perhaps you have the sense that I'm attracted to uh, things in science where there seems to be a story that hasn't been finished. And so uh, <clears throat> we set for ourselves the ambition of trying to measure and interpret quantum chemically the chiro optical response of a molecular knot and uh, its functional dependence on its orientation in space, its anisotropy. And in order to realize this ambition, we need to do four things. First, we need a molecular knot, and we need a fair amount of it, because ultimately, we're going to have to grow a large, high-quality single crystal that we have to polish. Uh, and um, um, uh, the reason why we need a crystal is if we want to understand the anisotropy our molecules have to be lined up with respect to one another. We can't just have them at tumbling around in solution. So we need a knot. We need a lot of it so we can grow a really high quality crystal. Then we need to do some special polarimetric measurements, light intensity measurements as a function of polarization modulation. And then we have to understand all of this on the basis of the electronic structure of that molecular knot. And so, <laughs> You know, what do you do when you have a really big job in front of you? If you want to get started right away, a very good thing to do is to hire a subcontractor. And so <laughs> we are accepting donations. Uh, my group can't synthesize uh, an op a, a, a knot, or I should probably more accurately say, my group today uh, certainly could not synthesize a molecular knot. <laughs> Uh, but the molecular knot that I like the most is this one, uh, which is the only hydrocarbon knot. And it's just a whole bunch of benzene rings connected head to tail all the way around. Uh, and if you had asked me in 2018, was something like this synthesizable, I would have just said absolutely not. This is a real tour, tour de force. Uh, and what's really nice about this knot is that it's fully conjugated. Uh, homogeneous chemically, each bit of it is the same, and it's fully conjugated. So there are some electrons that know that they're in a knot, and that's really going to be essential for interpretation. And if I could persuade uh, Professor Itami to give us some, he would probably have to give us a lot more than he even has in stock. Because as I say, we have to then take that and grow a large, high-quality single crystal that can be polished. 
So it needs to have a like an optical aperture of like a square millimeter. But let's just say we we you know let's just say we get that donation and we grow that crystal. Okay, now we're up to step three. Progress. But step three and four are fearsome. And I want to try to explain to you why steps three and four are so scary. And in order to understand this, we have to do some really deep history. And we have to go back to the French Revolution. I'm not kidding. And so <clears throat> after the French Revolution, after setting the calendar back to year one, the National Assembly decided that it wanted a uniform system of weights and measures. And they decreed that the meter will be one ten millionth of the 90 degree arc of latitude from the North Pole to the equator through Paris, of course. And in order to know what the how long the meter was, they had to measure the shape of the Earth. So they sent two young scientists to measure the shape of the Earth by triangulation, Jean-Baptiste Biot and Francois Arago. And here, the trick is you light you, you light fires on hilltops, and with telescopes, you measure the spherical triangles on the surface uh, in order to get distances. And they uh, did this, <clears throat> and they got uh, all the way through France and into Spain. And then when they hit the Mediterranean Sea, Biot went back to Paris with the preliminary measurements, but Arago continued with the work in Spain. But this was in the middle of the brutal Peninsula War, where Napoleon invaded uh, 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 Spain. And so the Spaniards were very suspicious of a Frenchman lighting beacons on mountaintops in the middle of this invasion. They thought he had a military purpose. And so he was captured at gunpoint and imprisoned, but he escaped. He was recaptured, escaped again, was recaptured once more and escaped again, and finally made it back to Paris two years late. He had long been given up for dead, but he was quickly elected to the French Academy of Sciences as a hero in the service of the Republic. But he didn't want to be a member of the French Academy of Sciences just because he didn't die. He wanted to be a member of the French Academy because he did something important. And so he then went out and did something important. He made an important discovery. He discovered the phenomenon of circular, circular birefringence or the differential refraction of left and right circularly polarized light. What he did is he took linearly polarized light, which had been liberated from crystals. This was a new tool in science that didn't exist when he had departed from Paris. But now he had this new tool, and he passed it along the high symmetry trigonal axis of a quartz crystal, and he saw funny colors coming out the back end. And nobody had seen anything like this before, and uh, he wasn't actually sure uh, about what he was seeing, but he called it phenomenologically chromatic polarization. It was something new, uh, and he kind of left the physics for later. Uh, but he was unable to see the same phenomenon if the wave vector of the light was coming in in any other direction. It had to be along the high symmetry direction. And we understand this now to be a consequence of the fact that along the high symmetry direction, the wave vector of the, 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 the electric field of the light experiences just one refractive index. But along a low symmetry direction, the light experiences two refractivities at the same time. That's called linear birefringence. And I think I pointed out in the tutorials that the linear birefringence can be 1,000 or even 10,000 times bigger than this effect. Linear birefringence is zero along the high symmetry direction, so it's, no, it's no, not a problem to see the optical activity. But along a low symmetry direction, you can't see it. Now, his buddy, Bio, soon got into the act and discovered that the same phenomenon, essentially, could be 
reproduced in solutions of some naturally occurring compounds like tartaric acid that comes from wine fermentation that uh, Pasteur made uh, such great uh, discoveries with. Uh, and uh, Bio recognized that uh, different molecules had different characteristic values, values that correspond to the rotation of the azimuth of polarized light. And he realized that this dispersion of colors was a consequence of the fact that different wavelengths get rotated by different amounts, and the dispersion has like a one over lambda squared dependence about. Uh, so he understood a little bit more of the physics of what was going on than did Arago. But nevertheless, Arago was quite uh, angry with his friend who had more or less commandeered the subject of research that Arago had invented. And their friendship fell apart and it um, only grew worse and worse over time. Uh, and um, But both of these guys left us with uh, legacies that we're still struggling with. So even though the first observation of the differential refraction of left and right circularly polarized light was made on a crystal, ever since it's been nearly impossible to make this measurement for any other crystal along general directions. Again, because of the effect of the, the fact that the linearized anisotropies are much, much larger. Bo. Uh, left us with some numbers. But there's not a single person in the world who can tell you in plain language why the value for tartaric acid is gonna be 12 instead of minus 12 or even minus 120. Because these numbers that are measured are average values of a second rank tensor for molecules rapidly randomly reorienting in solution. But optical activity is a bisinate phenomenon. And so some directions can be positive and some directions can be negative for the same molecule. And so the average value of a set of positive and negative numbers, it can be positive, it can be negative, it can be big, it can be small, it depends on what you're averaging. For monosinate tensorial quantities, if one eigenvalue is big, the average is big, and that makes sense. But for bisinate tensorial quantities, the average value is completely worthless. And so we get these numbers, <clears throat> and in fact, we teach students every year how to do experiments that deliver these numbers, but that have absolutely no connection to structure whatsoever. And so Bio gave us lots of pseudoscalar values that are labels for molecules, but nothing more. <clears throat> if you want to understand structure property relationships, you have to unpack the, its averages. In order to unpack the average value, you need to line your molecules up with respect to one another so you can establish what direction the wave vector is coming with respect to the coordinate system of your molecules. And the best way to line molecules up in chemistry is to grow a crystal. It's a pretty good way. So Bio needed to grow crystals to unpack his averages. But then you end up with crystals that you can't make measurements on. And then what you have to do is dissolve your crystals like Pasteur did so you can get something that you can measure. And we've been going round and round and round like this for literally two centuries. And there are very few things in science that we have been so bad at for so long, in my opinion. <clears throat> oh, this is, this is Arago's tomb. In Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris, He's, and this is some of his achievements, he prolongation of the meridian that was his work with Bio, and then polarization coloré, colored polarization. That was his second big achievement, along with measuring the shape of the Earth. Okay, so now I want to talk about what is the legacy of Bio with respect to interpretation and the legacy of Arago with respect to measurement. And um, like I say, Bio left us with a bunch of numbers 
that have no interpretation. <clears throat> and it's a pedagogical scandal that we teach millions of students every year how to do quantitative experiments that deliver random numbers to compounds. It wouldn't be allowed in freshman physics, but it's somehow allowed in chemistry. Uh, of course, we know today a lot more about the interaction of light and matter. And in fact, we know uh, where these numbers arise quantum chemically. And we know that it has to do with the electric fields that are generated by induced multipolar, it has to do with, with, with electric fields that come from induced multipolar moments that are generated during electronic transitions. And this is the quantum chemical formulation of this phenomenon. Uh, it's called the Rosenfeld equation. Leon Rosenfeld was Niels Bohr's assistant. Um, and uh, it couples ground states, ground state ex wave functions and excited state wave functions with electric dipoles and magnetic dipoles. Uh, but the trouble with this formula is that it is a sum over all electronic excitations. And that's a sort of a hard formula to compute. <clears throat> and some friends of mine at Yale, they asked the question a number of years ago, do you really need all the excited states? What does all mean? And so they started to compute this expression for the smallest chiral molecules they could think of. Uh, they started to compute this expression for some small chiral molecules, excited state by excited state. And they discovered that you had to get up to about 600 or 800 excited states before this uh, 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 sum started to converge. And so if you want to explain this old experiment that's taught in university classes to, you know, um, um, uh, you know, 20 year old uh, uh, students, <clears throat> you'd have to say, get an electronic structure computing engine, calculate the first 600 excited states, add up their contributions to this particular expression, and that's the answer. And that's a recipe for success that comes without any understanding whatsoever. We have some tricks now to, uh, to get around the sum over states, and I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, sums over states typically converge slowly and non-monotonically, but there's a, a, a shortcut it's a shortcut oh, that unfortunately doesn't really come with a map, but it's a shortcut uh, that gets you from here to there. And that's by using linear response uh, a theory, which looks at the frequency dependent polarizations due to linear perturbations on the ground state wave function only. And in that way, it's now possible to mimic this sum over states and get an answer, but it, all, but it doesn't help you narrate the answer. The linear response gives you the answer, but it doesn't narrate where the answer comes from. So that's what BO has left us with. Basically, uh, two centuries of, of, of ignorance. Now, uh, how about the Arago? So Arago was able to make a measurement along the high symmetry axis of quartz. It took 123 years before scientists could make a measurement in a different direction. And there's very few things that, it's, 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 that take us so long in science. I mean, somebody invented the Higgs boson and then somebody found it like a week later, right? Uh, it took 123 years for, to make this measurement in a different direction. That's a really long time. Uh, towards the end of the last century, when we finally had stable light sources and accurate electrophotometry and digital computers, there were new ways for dealing with the convolution of linear and circular anisotropies. And um, particularly Jinzo Kobayashi invented something called high accuracy universal polarimetry. And this is a, an experiment that was supposed to solve all of these problems. And it was adopted by six or eight groups around the world, but they all kind of quit because it's, it, was, it still was really hard work to do. It, it wasn't really universal and it wasn't completely accurate, uh, but it was nevertheless a really important and big advance. And we tried this experiment out in Seattle in 2006 and we were able, uh, this was um, actualized when a colleague 
uh, Verna Kaminsky uh, brought with him a special polarimeter that he had constructed. And we were able to measure the the optical rotation tensor of one crystal. And this was the thesis of Casey Claiborne, who was an absolutely brilliant uh, PhD student of the kind that you know, doesn't come along all that often, but it took five years. And so it was just too hard and too slow. And you, you, and in, in, because the effects that you're trying to measure are so small, you first have to become a master of the lapidary arts, cutting and polishing crystals so that you have perfect plane parallel slabs. And at a certain point, Casey just said, I, I will, I am, I'm not a jeweler, I will polish crystals no more. And uh, in any case, uh, when we moved to a new place, we, 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 we said, look, we have to just start from scratch. <clears throat> and rethink this whole business. And so we did a lot of things. We, we built a polarimeter that had no moving optical parts. We used a better theory. We got better at multi-parameter fitting of the different constitutive tensors that have to be uh, evaluated simultaneously. We learned how to work in non-normal incidents so that we could get every tensor element from one plane parallel section. That saved us a lot of uh, uh, polishing and cutting. And then we had to deal, because non-normal incidence is a pain, we had to deal then with the incoherencies of spectroscopic light sources. But after all that was done by these very talented guys, uh, we had a better machine, we had better math, we had a better method. And so we could go from crystal to data to analysis in a day instead of five years. So that's really Good. <laughs> it leaves. It leaves some. It leaves some. It leaves. Uh, gives you some time. What is the? What is the? What is? What is this? This is a surface that represents the optical response for wave vectors coming at the crystal from different directions. And so, in this direction, you measure a maximum positive response. In this direction, you measure zero. In this direction, you measure a maximum negative response. It's a representation surface of the tensor. And even though this was such a great thing to be able to reduce from this kind of data, uh, so what? What does it tell us about the crystal? We have this formula that enables us to connect structure to properties for molecules, but this was never implemented with periodic boundary conditions for dealing with crystals because there was no data for crystals and nobody ever cared. And we kind of thought that this was doable to implement this kind of computation with periodic boundary conditions. We thought it was with something that was within the realm of science, but we didn't think it was doable by us because you really need the fine-grained understanding of uh, the basis sets for wave functions and all kinds of other stuff. And so it was clear uh, that if we wanted to interpret this, we needed new computational tools. And so for that, what did we need? We needed another subcontractor to build this house. And there was a new professor who started at the University of Kansas, Marco Caricato, and he was a postdoc at Gaussian. And Gaussian is the most popular electronic structure computing engine that's out there. And so Marco was allowed to monkey around with the proprietary code inside Gaussian. And so I said to Marco, I said, Marco, it's very important that these kinds of calculations are implemented with periodic boundary conditions so that we can interpret what we're measuring for crystals. And Marco asked, well, how many researchers other than you <laughs> think that this is urgent? <laughs> and I said about zero, <laughs> about zero, kind of like the, 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 the yield of a cat name, about zero. And probably for this reason, Marco wrote the paper that solves this problem, but just last year. It's okay, it's good things sometimes you have to wait for. So now we're in good shape. We're gonna rely on some generous donor organization to give us the knots we need. My group has solved the measurement part of the problem and Marco is gonna deliver the interpretation part of the problem. 
So we have a we have a roadmap. We have a roadmap for our ambition. But we still don't know one thing whatsoever about the optical activity of any hypothetical isolated molecular knot in the gas phase even. We ought to start there before we measure anything. We ought to start just trying to think about how a molecular knot would interact with left and right circularly polarized light. And so what kind of knot ought that be? <clears throat> we don't like Wasserman's knot at all or Wasserman's hypothetical knot. And the reason why we don't like his knot is that all the electrons are in localized sigma bonds. And they, they, they don't move. And if electrons can't move, then the, the, your, the, 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 your light fields are being wasted. You need electrons to move if you're going to have large polarizabilities. And so the way to get electrons to move is to strip off all the hydrogen atoms in this molecule. And so one can imagine isomers of the molecule C60, buckyball, just 60 carbons, no hydrogens, but a family of isomers whose graphs would correspond to topological isomers. We can have C60, that's a, a chiral unknot, a C60, that's a chiral trefoil knot, a, C60, that's an amphichiral figure eight knot, uh, which happens to have a ground state that is achiral. It's amphichiral, but the ground state is achiral. So we can build these molecules and we can imagine them and they're stable molecules. They're not makeable, but they're stable molecules on a potential energy surface as long as they're not interacting with one another. Uh, so we can build these in a computer and we can calculate some stuff, but what can we calculate? Now, you may think that the only thing we can calculate is the chiral trefoil, where there's nothing to calculate for the, <laughs> for the achiral figure eight and the achiral unknot. But that's not exactly true. And so uh, now uh, I, I want to talk about not only the legacy of Vio and the le legacy of Arago, but their legacy on generations of students like me. And so <clears throat> this is a textbook I had when I was in the university and it looks like a fossil. It looks like a, it looks like a trilobite. Uh, it just has black and white text and line drawings and there's no color in it whatsoever. I mean, it really looks old fashioned. In any case, it taught me on page 123 that the non-superimposability of mirror images that gives rise to an antiomerism is also responsible for optical activity. That's not the sentence, uh, it's not a sentence with great clarity, but if we could simplify it and we could say that chirality is the necessary condition for optical activity. That's what I learned in school. And that just happens to be completely wrong. Uh, now, this textbook was written by two professors at New York University, as a matter of fact. That's not the evidence for why this is wrong. <laughs> it's just a coincidence, but it's wrong nevertheless. Go figure that I would end up the same place. And it's, it's especially wrong because science has known this to be wrong long before they wrote their textbook. And so there was a guy called Waldemar Fort who was using symmetry arguments to make crystal physics systematic in the beginning part of the century. And so he was looking at crystals and saying, what physical properties can crystals have given the symmetries that they have and the transformation laws of the tensors that they have to operate under? And he wrote a paper on theoretical and experimental clarifications of the optical behavior of active crystals. And he uh, showed that for some crystals that are achiral, uh, some crystals and oriented molecules that are achiral, they can belong to this point group D2D. That's like the symmetry of a, of a baseball or a tennis ball or any of its achiral subgroups. 
uh, there are non-zero tensor elements. So if you have molecules that have these symmetries and they're oriented, there are things that can be measured. And these are the nine elements of the tensor. And he shows which ones must be non-zero. And um, this is well known. And in fact, every textbook in crystal physics that was written in the 20th century says this very plainly. But these are books that people that write chemistry textbooks don't refer to when they do their business. Another, another bad thing, though, a uh, bad bit of luck for Voldemort Fote, is that his paper appeared on page 645 of the 1905 edition of Annalen der Physik. And on page 639, right before, there's a paper by one Dr. Albert Einstein, uh, the title is, Does the Inertia of a Body Depend Upon Its Energy Content? And this is the first time that E equals MC squared was introduced to science. And so imagine, you know, if you write, you write your best paper, the best paper you've ever written, and it just happens to fall immediately in the shadow of the best paper that was ever written by anybody, right? I don't think people read much after page 639. What are you going to do? All right. But now we're, I think, ready to sort of rethink the optical activity of molecules from the ground up. And what we want to do is we want to liberate ourselves from the constraints of real molecules. Real molecules are, 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 are rigid and inconvenient. We want, to, we, want to, we want to be like topologists. We want to be loose and flexible. We have to forget about chirality because the linkage between chirality and optical activity is simply wrong and infelicitous. That's very liberating. And we want to pretend like we have some kind of quantum chemical knot plot where we can just do whatever we want in a very free and loose way. What we really want is a molecule that's kind of just like a pipe cleaner that we can bend and twist in any way we want, and then we can make calculations on it using quantum chemistry. So we want a molecular pipe cleaner that we can just, you know, we can make any shape we want. <clears throat> Doesn't have to actually exist as long as it's physically credible. And I was delighted to see uh, that, um, you know, Professor Nawada uh, got very far with pipe cleaner models of molecules yesterday. Pipe cleaners are really good models for lots of molecules. Um, and uh, you know, it's, I think, yeah, so there's one of these that's attached to the, it's another one of these that's attached to the, 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 my, my, the, my belt loop here. Uh, you, you know, that has nothing to do with um, a chemistry, but uh, that's so that um, my son doesn't take my pants. So these are very useful. You know, you can make all kinds of molecules. You can hold on to your pants. Uh, and uh, they have lots and lots of functions. You can make these crazy catenanes out of pipe cleaners. So we want a molecular pipe cleaner. And this is our molecular pipe cleaner. It's got to be a pipe cleaner, though, that's responds to the, that is, responds to atomic physics. That's to be a realistic pipe cleaner. And so our molecular pipe cleaner is going to be a linear molecule that has the formula C18H2. It's going to be a polyine, just a long string of alternating single and triple bonds that terminated by two hydrogens. And there's a happy linear molecule. There are molecules like this that uh, you know exist in the space. Lots of linear polycarbons. Oops. Uh, but then we want to bend it like a pipe cleaner and see how its optical properties change and compute its light matter interactions. Now, is that a credible thing to do is to bend this molecule? Yeah, these molecules are incredibly flexible. And in fact, you can take C18 and you can bend it into a circle. And that molecule has been made on a surface and it has been characterized by a scanning tunneling microscope and you can examine its wave functions and everything else. 
very flexible, these molecules. So we took this molecular pipe cleaner and we bent it in different ways and we calculated it, the, the, the gyration tensor, the optical rotation tensor, and we plotted it as a surface for different bent pipe cleaners. And notice that all of these pipe cleaners though, they're just bent. So they all, they all live in planes. They're completely planar, they egg chiral. <clears throat> And they're quite, they have quite, quite big optical activities, uh, certainly compared to like Wasserman's trefoil knot. And then we started to add twist or torsion to these bent structures. And then we computed a whole bunch of things. And what you can see is that bending is highly generative of optical activity, but twisting takes it away. You add chirality, and the optical activity drains away very rapidly. And that's because in order to put a twist into something that's a bend, you have to start relinearizing your molecule all over again. And an intuitive understanding, so this is completely sort of backwards from what you're supposed to think. You add chirality and things are supposed to get more optically active. Uh, they do get more optically active only if the molecules are in solution. So if you look at the bent structures, they're the most responsive, but the average value is zero. The average value or uh, averaged over all orientations is zero. The chiral molecules have a little bit of one sign left over, and there'd be something to be measured in solution but it would be a small fraction of what is actually possible if the structure were oriented. And what most people tend to fuss about is whatever residual, uh, whatever residual uh, yellow or blue you happen to see in a solution of molecules rapidly randomly reoriented. Now, if you had this molecule in a solution, you would measure zero not because it was optically inactive, but because the spatial average was zero. But to a frustrated experimentalist, measuring zero one day and measuring zero in another day, it seems like that means the same thing, but it means very different things. The average value of something that's not, the average value of something that happens to be zero is very different than nothing but they both come out to the same value in your instrument, yeah? The average value of something that's zero and nothing seems like it's the same, but it's very different in a meaningful and profound way. And so we can say, uh, much to the, much to the uh, annoyance of some people, that chirality is bad for optical activity. Yes? So you said that the reason that twisting removes the optical activity is because it reduces the bending. But so, what if you just keep the curvature the same and add torque? Does it still remove the optical activity? Um. So, uh, uh, this. So, so the, the 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 way I like to think about this is that we need a big transition magnetic dipole moment to contribute to this expression. That's part of the calculation. And if you want to have a big magnetic dipole moment, you want to enclose the biggest area that you can. So if you're going to run around a track and get as far around the track in a certain amount of time as you can, it's much better if you're running on a flat track than if you're forced to run up a spiral staircase. The spiral staircase wastes a lot of your energy. It in, doesn't enclose the same kind of area that you get by running on a flat track. So something that's bent and flat gives you much larger magnetic dipole moments than something that's helicoidal. That's the heuristic way to think about this. So it's better to run around a track than up a spiral staircase. Okay, so now we can start dealing with pipe cleaners that are knotted. It's easy to go from curves to knots just by joining the ends. Uh, and um, I just want to point out that the, the, the previous equation, this Rosenfeld equation, uh, is really only applicable to things that are in solution because 
Uh, in crystals, there's another tensor that contributes to the overall response, which has to do with the coupling of electric dipoles and electric quadrupoles. So there's a there's an electric dipole, electric uh, there's an electric dipole, magnetic dipole coupling, and there's an electric dipole, electric quadrupole coupling. That term averages to zero in solution, but in a in an oriented molecule, that's important. So the overall response is actually a sum of two different tensors, and uh, each of these contribute uh, to the many excited states. But we can separate out the total response to the part that comes from the magnetic dipole coupling and the electric quadrupole coupling, and we can do that for, for both the trefoil knot and the figure eight knot. And uh, for the... for you know, in order to save time and energy, we can just, uh, we can we can see that it's really the electric dipole, magnetic dipole coupling that seems to explain the overall response in the main. And so I'm just going to set electric quadrupoles to the side for the time being, since they're sort of a pain in, in any case. Uh, but uh, I see the trefoil and I see a tensor. And while it's not required by symmetry to be monocyanate, it is monocyanate all of the eigenvalues are the same. And these are weird units, weird atomic units. So they're eigenvalues, but you can think about that they're related in some way to degrees per millimeter of rotation, but they're in atomic units. Um, and the figure eight knot is different. Uh, it's bisinate in the plane perpendicular to the high symmetry axis. So it goes from positive to zero to positive to zero to positive, it changes sign. And, um, we can look at the output and we can see uh, that there really are two excited states that give by far the biggest electric and magnetic dipole moments. These happen to be the 19th and the 20th excited states, and they're a pair of degenerate excited, they're a pair of degenerate states because these molecules have high symmetry. And we can uh, compute by just summing over states 19 and 20, we can compute the overall gyration tensors that we get from linear response theory. And from just those two excited states, we get this and we get this, which is pretty good. It's pretty good. It's not perfect, but it's only two states and it's a lot less than 600. And so one can begin to explain how this arises by looking at the individual wave functions themselves. And all you really need to know in order to uh, intuit this is just a little bit of vector calculus. So for the trefoil, the symmetry is such that the electric dipole and magnetic dipole moments in these states are anti-parallel. And uh, that means that uh, both of these moments make anti-parallel projections onto the wave vectors in the x, y direction. It doesn't matter if the wave vector is pointing along x or the wave vector is pointing along y. Both of those moments make anti-parallel projections onto the wave vector. So if you take the if you take the dot product of the cross product of the wave vector and the moments, you discover that when you change the direction of your wave vector by 90 degrees, the the quantity doesn't change sign uh, for the trefoil knot. But for the figure eight knot, the moments are perpendicular to one another. And so in one case, they make parallel projections onto the wave vector. In another case, they make anti-parallel projections onto the wave vector. And that means that when you change the wave vector, you change the sign of the response. And so that means that, ah, I, I kind of understand. I kind of understand the basic physics of the light scattering the differential left and right circularly polarized light scattering of some imaginary knot in a computer in the gas phase. That's something. We also did C58 because in organic chemistry, people fuss about systems that have 4n electrons and 4n plus 2 electrons. This has something to do with aromaticity. Uh, but that's only really an important effect for smallish molecules. These molecules are so big that, you know, they're almost developing their own band structures. And so this kind of electron counting is not really terribly important for C58. 
But we also looked at C59. C59 is very different than C58 because it has an odd number of carbon atoms. So very different, very, very much more responsive and much more anisotropic. That's kind of weird. And um, the reason it's much more responsive is the fact that if we have a, an even cycle, we can have bond length alternating between single and triple and single and triple all the way around. But if we have an odd number of carbons, then it's got to be double bonds all around the cycle. And so you can think of this as being made of a, of a, of a, of a circuit composed of big resistors in series and small resistors in series, where the big resistors are the transport of electrons through the single bonds. Uh, but for an odd structure, you kind of have an intermediate resistor going all the way around. And so that's going to have the bigger charge transport. Uh, but there are some other weird things that can happen, like there can be weird Jan Teller distortions that make one carbon particularly special. And we kind of think that we're, what we're really calculating is some kind of superposition of this Jan Teller distorted molecule and the one that has all double bonds. Uh, but in any case, uh, these are things that we can we can um, we can rationalize. OK, <clears throat> but I, but remember what I said at the beginning, I would like to measure and interpret. And so far, we haven't measured anything, right? So what about the measurement part? What can we measure? Well, we, we've seen beautiful presentations about molecular knots. There are people making beautiful, gorgeous molecular knots. And, and you can separate enantiomers, and you can measure circular dichroism spectra. But these are spectra that correspond to average values of some knots in solution. These knots are often, cons you know, um, 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 by composition, they're often complex. They have weird metal atoms and, and all, you know, some aromatic parts, some aliphatic parts, some hetero atoms. And uh, there is some data in the literature, but it doesn't have an interpretation. And nobody has even bothered to try to interpret it because it's just a spectrum of the average response of something in solution. Doesn't help us at all. <laughs> There is a paper in which a group carved a pentafoil knot out of silver with a laser. And they showed that it was a polarization rotator in the microwave part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And um, there are some aspects of this experiment that we don't fully understand because for one molecule, you should actually generate elliptically polarized light. It shouldn't just be, that is, the scattered light shouldn't be in phase with the driving field. It should be out of phase by a quarter of a wave. And um, so we've been corresponding with this group to try to figure out why we think about this or understand this in different ways, but it doesn't really matter because I don't know how to carve a knot out of silver with a laser. Uh, so this is not going to help us really in any way. Then, look, the only guy that's, yeah, the only guy's not looking. <laughs> uh, it's a good time to turn away, Yvonne. <laughs> There's uh, Yvonne has these knots the way he photopolymerized uh, colloidal particles inside a pneumatic liquid crystal. And there ought to be an optical activity that's associated with this knot that is, that is communicated through the pneumatic host. But this is also not like, you know, off the shelf stuff you can just buy uh, and uh, make measurements on. But this, this could be a system that you could make measurements on. It could be. It would be hard because the pneumatic is so anisotropic, but maybe. <clears throat> so in principle, there's a there's an, an optical activity associated with these kinds of things. And in principle, that kind of optical activity could be extracted with the polarization transfer microscopes that we have made in our laboratory. Um, and so... Um, I invite Yvonne and anybody related to Yvonne to visit us anytime and, and we can take a peek. What are we going to do in the meantime? Well, in the meantime, <laughs> we resort to our, 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 our goat. We don't have, a, I mean, we don't actually have a goat in the laboratory. We just like the fur of this kind of goat. 
Uh, it has nice homogeneous, modestly birefringent fibers. And those we can just tie, right? And so we can tie them and we can measure their linear birefringence and that's an easy thing to do. But the harder thing to do is to see the sign of the crossings optically in the differential refractivity of left and right circularly polarized light. But we can see that this is left-handed trefoil, this is a right-handed trefoil. That is a measurement of the optical activity of a knot of some kind. Very easy to make. Uh, and uh, so far, that's the only experiment I can point to. This comes out by taking the natural logarithm of the polarization transfer matrix. And that gives us the circular birefringence as part of that. As we pull the knot tighter and tighter, uh, things start to get more complicated because we start to, when things get tight, the signs of the crossings become ambiguous. And now we start putting strain in the fibers and that changes the optical properties. But all of this is fascinating uh, to see how the circular birefringence of a knot changes as one uh, 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 strains it and so on. But um, one thing that was really revelatory uh, uh, as a participant of this school was seeing Sabetha's uh, work on textiles that I didn't know anything about. And that uh, suggests that the differential polarization imaging of knitting, you know, is should, ought to be a whole interesting kind of optical topology. And um, it was, it was, uh, Sabet has already gone home, but um, I hope that she can uh, bring her uh, fabrics uh, to New York and we can take a look at those. All right, so we've come to the end, and I told you about the, the seminal discoveries of Bio and Narago uh, that uh, caused so much confusion for so long. I told you they started out as friends, then they became bitter enemies, and uh, they diverged on perhaps every important question in French society. Bio was a royalist, and he supported the French economy, which was based on the slave system in the West Indies. Uh, Arago was an abolitionist and he was a Republican, not like a 21st century American Republican, a different kind of Republican. And um, B.O. even aspired to place the entire French slave economy on the systematic basis of polarimetry by inventing by inventing a, an experiment called saccharimetry. And saccharimetry was polarimetry that was especially geared to determining how much sugar was in any batch of molasses. So when um, uh, enslaved West Africans uh, harvested sugar cane, boiled it down to make molasses, how much sugar was in any batch of molasses, it depended upon the growing conditions, how long it was boiled, all kinds of things. You just didn't know how much sugar you had. But Bio invented a polarimeter that even a plantation owner could use to determine how much sugar was in any batch of molasses. And so he wanted to systematize the entire French economy, which was based upon sugar from the West Indies. But before he got too far along in this ambition, uh, there were pro-democracy revolts throughout Europe and King Louis Philippe abdicated the throne. And Arago was made uh, the minister of the colonies in the provisional government. And within two weeks of assuming that authority, he abolished slavery throughout the whole French empire. He said the provisional government declares that slavery and assault against human dignity will be completely abolished in all French colonies and possessions. Francoise Arago. So Arago is really the hero of this story and Bio is more like the goat. Now, you might be particularly interested though in Arago's signature, not for its political force. But because if you reflect it in a mirror and then you rotate it by 90 degrees, you can see that in the flourish at the end of his signature, which was not uncommon in the 19th century, he reproduced his surname, but in mirror image, Arago. It's a cool trick. 
So I was thinking about this. I was thinking, <clears throat> is this a non-trivial knot, Arago signature? And you don't have to think about it too long to decide that it's not. It isn't a it, 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 it isn't a non-trivial knot because, of course, when you're signing something, anytime you cross over ink that has been previously deposited, you're 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 going over it, and so the whole thing could, if you know, if 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 you could separate the lines from one another, would simply uh, separate out into an unknot, and so uh, Arago. Uh, uh, he worked with his enantiomer or, or his enantiomorphous signature, but it was topologically trivial. I've had some really great students and collaborators. And I have just one announcement to make uh, that in the summer of 2025, we're going to be hosting the International Symposium on Chirality at New York University. So I invite everybody to come to Manhattan and bring your knots and bring your friends. And um, it's really been a pleasure to participate in the school and uh, happy to answer any questions.